I failed to mention at the beginning of Mass that for those who don't know me, my name is Peter Jives. I'm a Jesuit priest, a physician, and I run a nonprofit organization that seeks social justice for all people. Uh, and I'm here today and glad to be among you. So I mentioned at the beginning of Mass that I wanted to speak about the prophetic voice. We heard Isaiah, we heard John the Baptist, two great, great prophets of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And they spoke about a different way of living. They spoke about something new that was coming, that God is not finished with creation. And we know from history, the prophetic voice is not appreciated in its own life. Uh, they either wait until people die or they kill them. And then monuments are created to the prophetic voice that arises throughout history. And while we believe biblically that John the Baptist and Jesus were prophetic voices, other prophets have arisen through the ages among, among ordinary people that really challenge the way we live, challenge governments as to the ideological positions they take that are harmful to so many people. And that's what I want to talk about today. We are called to respond to the prophetic voice in our own time. In a world right now where there's been outbreaks of war, violence, uh, lack of understanding, lack of acceptance of other people in both the Middle East and Europe and other parts of the world as well. As Judeo-Christians, we are called to live a different way. And that's what I'd like to speak about. First, I, as I often do, I'd like to speak about a historical context to the prophetic readings that we have today, and then talk about what does this prophetic voice today mean to us? And then finally, what can we do? We're not in the Middle East, we're not in Europe, we're here, but there is still much we can do. So first, the historical context. Isaiah's reading comes from the sixth century before the Christian era. Israel was divided into two kingdoms at the death, more or less at the death of Solomon, around a thousand years before the Christian era. In the eighth century, the original Isaiah spoke, condemning the way the Jewish people were living for broken covenant relationship, idolatry, a lack of consideration for orphan widows, the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized. And the northern kingdom paid a price. They were taken off into Assyria in captivity. We're speaking now in the 6th century. This is not the original Isaiah. It is a follower of Isaiah who speaks with the same line of thought, condemning the people of, uh, of Israel at that time. And what he's up to now is that the people of Israel have gone off to Babylon for about 50 years of captivity, slavery, inappropriate, unjust treatment, and now they're coming back. And Isaiah greets them. They're coming back, they will rebuild the temple. The, the uh, Persians have overthrown the Babylonians. King Cyrus of Persia has offered to help them rebuild the temple with monetary sources, to return the gold, the instruments, the chalices that had been wiped out or taken away by the Babylonians. So it's a great time in Jewish history. But Isaiah is saying to them, there's something more. There's something more that is going to come. Have that expectation. He's saying that within history, there'll be somebody who is anointed to really show us a different way of living, to come to the people who are suffering, to end suffering for all time. And in our gospel reading, we hear John. He appears out of the desert in the first century, about the year 30, around the time of Jesus' just before Jesus' public ministry. Jesus is unknown to the world except to the village that he lives in up in Galilee in Nazareth. And John is telling them that there is something coming. That the Messiah is coming into this world. And the Jewish people who are all in the expectation in the first century, the Jewish belief was that the end of the world was coming in their lifetime. And who's the Messiah? Where is it? And John's saying, it's not me but there is somebody among you who will come after me, who will be the anointed one of God, who will usher into what Jesus called himself, this reign of God over creation, the kingdom of God. That is what he preached. It was a world where there would be love, where there would be compassion, and where there would be justice for all people. And that is what we're celebrating at Christmas time the incarnation that came into this world. 
God's decision, the Judeo-Christian belief that God is active in history and God watches, and God made a decision 2,000 years ago to enter because the world was awry and God had decided he will show an example through Jesus of what it means to really be a human being, to live as God would have us live, and in the process offer us salvation. <clears throat> that by following the way of Jesus, salvation was being offered to us. And if we accepted that offer, we would follow Jesus in this world, not only by living the dogma that we believe in as important as it is, but by taking on Jesus' values in a world that does not accept what is going on. And so my second point then is, what does this prophetic voice mean to us today? I mentioned it continues to arise in history. In our lifetimes, many of us here, <coughs> we know of uh, Dorothy Day, we know of Oscar Romero, Thomas Merton. There are people who have arisen in history who have challenged the world order saying the way things are working are unfair, unjust for many, many people. And that people at the top, as in Jesus' own time, in Isaiah's time, there was tremendous exploitation. This is not how God desires humanity to live. God desires not human suffering. God desires the fulfillment of each and every one of us. And in the process, to come to know the salvation that is being offered for us. And truth be known, that salvation has been woven into the fabric of God's salvation, desire for salvation for all of creation. We gain our salvation by participating in the ongoing creation and salvation of this world for all people, not just some. To God, it does not matter the color of your skin, the religion you profess, the sexual identity that you claim. God created all and God desires the salvation of each and every one of us. And so, when we think about the prophetic voice today, what comes to my mind is Abraham Heschel, he was a rabbi, came to great prominence in the years, the 60s, the 1960s. There were two reasons that I know of Abraham Heschel. One is, he wrote a two-volume work. He was a scholar, he wrote a two-volume work on the prophets. And the second one was, is that he lived the prophetic voice in his own life. There is an iconic picture of him walking arm in arm with Martin Luther King, Ralph Abernathy, John Lewis across the bridge, the Pettus Bridge from, Selma to, uh, from Montgomery to Selma, Alabama, in which they are arm to arm and met violence in return for what they were doing. What they were after were equal voting rights for people of color in Alabama. And in the 1960s, that was unacceptable to the government of Alabama and many, many of its citizens who were predominantly white. It's to stand up, to speak truth to power. And that's what he did. But I want to focus on really his, his scholarly work, the prophetic voice that he wrote about. There was an image of God in history up until around the time of Vatican II, uh, both by Christians as well as Jewish people, that um, God was immutable. God didn't react to anything we were doing. God was just God living God's life. And Heschel said no. He said God reacts to human activity. And he called it pathos. That was the word he used. And pathos to him meant an emotional response to the way human beings are behaving. And the way it unfolded, most of the time, when the pro prophetic voice, Isaiah and others, rose up to condemn the way the Jewish people were living, for their idolatry, for their lack of concern, for the uh, poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, the widow, the orphan, <coughs> what he was saying is that there's three phases of God's reaction to human behavior when it is bad. The first one is a tremendous sorrow. But he said, God is emotional. God is incredibly hurt by the way human beings are acting. And from a Jewish perspective, Heschel said, this God of creation, Yahweh, had taken the people of Israel out of Egypt and slavery and brought them to a land, Canaan, of flowing in milk and honey. It was, a clan, it was a land that was already civilized. And they were brought to it to live off of it, to prosper. And God said, look at what you've done. I've treated you so well, and look at how you're treating other people. 
And from God's sorrow then came tremendous anger of saying, how dare you do this? How dare you live the way you're living after what I have done for you? And there will be a price to pay. And the prophets often warned that there will be a price and you will suffer for it. And in Isaiah's time, what we hear is the northern and the southern kingdoms are destroyed. People are carried off into slavery. Harsh, harsh existences. And then finally what we hear is God's compassion and mercy. That God's anger in history lasts but a moment. And God's mercy and compassion lasts forever. God would always say, I have not abandoned you. I offer you again an opportunity to live as you are being called to live. The Jewish people, when they returned from Babylon, were called to live as a light to this world, to show other people what it means to live as God would have us live. And Isaiah claimed that the people around the world would see them. They would come to the temple. They would come to Jerusalem to learn from the Jewish people how we are to live. <coughs> and so today, where are the prophets? I've mentioned some who stand out, but there's the prophetic voice that might be arising within any of us uh, or the, 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 the social circles in which we travel. Two weeks ago, I had a conversation <coughs> with a Jewish friend of 30 years. And he said to me, what is going on in the Middle East right now is pure evil on both sides. Hamas, the terrorist group that attacked Jerusalem and killed uh, 1,200 people, carried off, I believe, 240 uh, prisoners or captives, of which about 100 still remain, is abominable. But the Jewish response to this has been equally abominable. There have been, my numbers come, I think, from the United Nations, approximately 18,000 people killed in Gaza in the past two months. 50,000 people have been wounded. The infrastructure of that country is imploding. And what some commentators are saying now is that in the next several weeks and months, what we're going to see is more deaths from illness than we see from bombs. This Jewish man's point of view was to say, number one, not all Jews favor what the Israeli government is doing. Number two, not all Palestinians favor what Hamas has done. And number three, I want to say that not all people in this country who criticize our government for funding the weapons that have killed so many people and refuse to call for a ceasefire in the United Nations, because we do that does not mean we are anti-Semitic and does not mean we are unpatriotic. What it means is we are listening for a different voice, the voice of God in history, the prophetic voice that challenges us to live above the ideological positions of people who want dominance of one over the other and to say no. As Christians, we will live as Jesus has asked us to live with God's love, compassion, sense of justice for all God's people. Inviting not division and not hatred and not violence, but acceptance of people. A willingness to try to work together and to live as human beings, as, God, as we have been meant to live. And so finally, what then can we do? We're not in the Middle East. We're not in Europe, Ukraine. I think there are two things we can do, certainly something to think about. One is we can personally live by a commitment, especially during this time of Advent, as we await not the birth of Jesus which occurred 2,000 years ago, but the mystery of the incarnation, that God entered human history to save it, to teach us another way of living. We can take seriously the gospel stories we hear, and we can reflect in our own lives, what does it mean to me to claim to be a Christian? And I think the answer is to move beyond dogma, as good as it is, to take on the values of Jesus in our ordinary lives. To live with love, to live with compassion, and to live with a sense of justice for all people that we meet in this church congregation, in our civil activities, in our families, among our friends. Treating people with human dignity and their human rights that are God-given. <coughs> that is what we're called to do. So we can personally respond, even though it is not in Europe or the Middle East, 
we can witness to this world a different way of living, the Christian way of living, which quite frankly is the Judeo-Christian way of living. The prophetic voice would say nothing different than what we're living. There is no justification from Catholic social teaching to justify the violence that is going on in this world today and that this government, our government, is funding. It is abominable. The second way we can act is socially. We can add our voice to others in groups, perhaps a religious organization, perhaps a social organization, that is speaking out against what is going on in our world today. That is what the prophets did in their time. It is what we are called to do in our time, to stand up and speak truth to power that this is not the way to live and that we as Christians will witness to a different way and accept the consequences that come from doing so. Jesus died for speaking the way he did. Some of the prophets died for what they did. Oscar Romero died for what he did, speaking up for the people of El Salvador. That is the mission we're on. Can we accept that this holiday season as we really prepare to witness to and accept the incarnation in our lives? What does it mean? We heard a child talk about Santa Claus. That's fine for a child. It is not fine for an adult. Jesus was not born or will not be born this December 25th. He was born 2,000 years ago. What we're celebrating this Christmas is the incarnation, the mystery of this loving God who entered history to teach us first and foremost what it means to be a human being. May we have the grace, the courage to have the freedom to put aside self-interest and ideological interests to seek God's will in this world and what God is asking of us as Christians to witness to other people. And if we do, we are promised as Christians that what the God of creation did in raising Jesus from the dead will do the same for each and every one of us. And so, on Gaudete Sunday, may we rejoice always in the Lord because there is more out there that is right in front of us today.